Welcome to Progeny's Expert Interview Series. And today we're going to be talking about the role of partners when you're going through your fertility journey. So there will be a lot of tips if you have a partner around. They might want to view it with you. And with us, talking about their journey, is Gretchen Christine Rossi, who you probably know from The Real Housewives of OC, and her fiance, Slade Smiley, who you also know from The Real Housewives of OC. So before we get into these tips, everybody about their partners. Tell us a bit about your journey. Do you want to start? Uh, sure, I can start. Go ahead, partner. Yeah, <laughs> I'll dive right in. Um, our, our journey deals with, uh, with a lot of struggle and hardship, actually. You know, when we had made the decision that we wanted to have children of our own, um, unfortunately, 18 years ago now, almost 18 years ago now, I had a vasectomy. Um, so that immediately put us in a situation where either I had to go through the reversal or we had to consider IVF. Um, Gretchen was brave enough to, to uh, want to try the IVF process initially mm -hmm. uh, because she knew that the success ratio of the reversal, the VAS reversal, was quite low. Um, at least we had been told that at the time. So she, we went through our first round of IVF. Uh, 14 embryos retrieved, 14, for, or no, I'm sorry, 19 embryos no, 19 eggs. 19 eggs, 14 fertilized, uh, and the morning of a fresh transfer, we lost absolutely everything. The doctor called at 5.30 in the morning and said, everything arrested. And the diagnosis? They didn't... Unwilling to disclose. Yeah. So you can imagine that quite the hardship. I think you cried for three or four days. At least. At least. Yeah, I couldn't even get out of bed. Um, so oh, to go right. through the cost, the emotional turmoil, the shots, you know, the whole process, which is as difficult as it is. And let me also add that if you lose a pregnancy, if you've been taking shots and suddenly it stops, it is like losing a pregnancy. Yeah. And it is a mini postpartum. Yeah, it was. Physically as well as psychologically. Yes, yeah. so much so. Yeah. And that was, that, that's interesting you say that because I think that's the part that a lot of people didn't understand. It's like within three weeks I gained 10 pounds and uh, I would be okay gaining that weight if you have something to show for it afterwards. But going through um, the daily shots and all the daily emotional up and down, the roller coaster, the hormones, the, you know, the pain, and then get right to that point where you're so excited to do that transfer and then all of a sudden them calling you saying we've lost everything and not really even have an explanation why everything was lost or not at least I should say a good enough explanation that made sense to us um, was just devastating. So I literally was in bed for probably three days, could not even get out. I just was hysterical and crying and just a mess. And then honestly it took me two years a postpartum depression, which I didn't even have a baby, but I considered it like that. Yeah. Um, just really, really, or I should probably say more PTSD, I think is what happened for me on that situation. Um, and it took me a good two years before I even wanted to discuss looking at it again or considering it again. Let's put a perspective on this. If you're the kind of person, and you both seem to be, and you know, many of us are, who take responsibility because you want the control. Yes. You're willing to do your own thing. You're willing to find the doctors. You're willing to go through IVF. You're willing to create careers. You say, give me the opportunity and I will take the responsibility. And then you're in a situation where you have no control. You spent the money. You moved forward. You took the opportunity. And now you have no control. That's the reason most people react so strongly. Yeah. What's withdrawn is the answer. What do I do next? So it took you two years to figure out what to do next? It really did. I mean, I, I think emotionally, physically, mentally, financially, you're so drained from going through something like that. And I think, I think for us in particular, why it was so drastic is you can go from one day the doctor telling you a 14 embryos yeah. and strong embryos that even got to blastocyst stage then six hours before they're supposed to implant in you, they all just died and arrested. So that, I think, was the part that was the most devastating, is I literally thought I was going to have the moral issue of what am I going to do with the other, you know, 13 children on ice for, you know, am I, am, what am I going to do with those? I actually thought I was, we were going to be struggling with that moral issue rather than that we didn't have any at all. So, yeah. um, so it, it did. I mean, I it think it, it was a shock. And yeah. I, so and what it did finally moved you forward? Two years later? Well, I, I made a decision. Okay. Um, I made so a decision. So the partner helped. Yeah. 
Definitely. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, she had gone through so much, and mm -hmm. I know that she was going through that because of a decision I had made to have a procedure many, many years before. Mm -hmm. so the vasectomy. I, vasectomy, yeah. correct. So I decided to go forward with a vas reversal. And I said, look, you did this first round. Good for you. It's only fair that I go and have a shot at doing this vas reversal because it had become so clinical at that moment, and we really had this dream of being able to be together and, and create a child you know, naturally versus having to go through physicians and doctors and all these struggles. Sure. So I went through the reversal. So then you spend 18, was it 18 months? But let me tell the story because this was just so sweet how he did it. So I was 38, it was coming on my 38th birthday. Obviously at 38 you're very anxious about getting older and um, and we hadn't really talked about, I, I, I remember I, right before my 38th birthday, I said, we probably need to start revisiting this whole IVF thing. But he could tell I was very hesitant about going back and doing the IVF. So well, for she'd my, gotten sick on some of the medications. I mean, it was, yeah. it was really difficult. And she was sick for both of you, so yeah. that's why yeah. you offered. Yeah. So on my 38th birthday, in my birthday card, he wrote me this beautiful note. And then he just said, I've already scheduled my reversal. It's for December 3rd. And so, and because my birthday was in October. And so it was so sweet because he already went and took the steps necessary yeah. to get the surgery on the calendar and make it happen. And bless his heart, he's gone through two, you know, big surgeries for us in order to have these babies. Because when you have a vasectomy, you have to go in there the first time and then he has to go back again to do the reversal. And it's not always successful. Was yours successful? No, it was not. It was yeah. not. Yeah. So then we went through those emotions 18 again, months later. Again, no control. No, no control. control. And you're waiting months and months hoping that something's going to happen. Right. You're still going worrying, to the doctors. Worrying, watching, waiting. Mm -hmm. Worrying, no watching, control. waiting. Right. And every time I would go to, you know, do a test to see if uh, everything was working, unfortunately there's just, you know, there was no, sp there was no sperm. So. Yeah, so that was, that was again, another heartbreak we had to go through. I went, that was actually my 39th birthday when that happened, and I was just a mess and crying, and like, I don't, how, are we, how are we ever going to have a baby again? Because I really didn't want to go through IVF. And then um, it was weird. At the end of 2017, I just, for some reason, I just said, 2018, like, I feel like it's my year. It's going to happen. Like, and I just, I, I manifested it. Like, I created it. And I started meditating, and I just really put everything, all of my thoughts and energy into, I really want to make this happen. And, and for some reason, through that process, there was a bit of heal healing th for me through that meditation. And it was weird. It just, everything just started aligning and happening. And then we ended up back here at uh, SCRC with Dr. Suri. And, uh, and it's just been such a great experience so far. I can tell you a bit of how it happened. We used to think that from feelings came your thoughts and behavior. What we now know is you can choose your thoughts, yes. choose your behavior, and it changes your feeling. Yes. And you chose to start thinking differently, to take care of yourself, to meditate, yes. to think positively, mm -hmm. and you began to feel different. It's so true. Good for you. That's so true. You are both good at taking control. You're only frustrated when it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. So Very the answer true. is keep moving and taking control. Yes. So where are you now? So we just finished round two of, um, of a cycle and the first round we did okay. It wasn't as good as we had hoped or anticipated, but I got really, really sick during my first cycle through mm -hmm. um, some of the antibiotics and stuff. So um, we didn't do as good as we hoped, but we just finished the second round. I just had my egg retrieval two days ago. And, uh, and I she think, looks great. I think we had, uh, thank you, honey. I think we had 14 um, eggs that they retrieved. Mm -hmm. So we're very happy and positive about it, but obviously we're only on day three or something, so we still have a couple more days to find out if they went to blastocysts and, and if they're genetically sound. But I, what's it, what I love about what Gretchen has said prior to that story is that, you know, on, she really has manifested this all happening in the way it's happened. We have a, a note on the fridge that says, thoughts become things. That's right. Right? So we're very focused on those positive thoughts becoming the things that we want to have in That's our exactly life. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. The first round, um, we got great news. There, there were things that you know g were genetically sound through that first round, and so we we have that. And, mm -hmm. and, and having that, I think, has changed this second round for her as well because so much stress is alleviated because you sit around thinking about, can we have a genetically sound baby? Is it even possible for me yeah. to get pregnant? Is there something wrong with us genetically? Is this actually going to work? We, we've had a bad experience in the in the past. What will happen this time? So, you know, when Dr. Suri called us and said, look, here's the results of your first round, it was like this huge weight 
lifted yeah. off of our shoulders. And, and the clinic was very wise to say, look, this will result in a pregnancy for you. However, it is our suggestion that if you think you want to have a second child or a third child, mm -hmm. let's talk about going through that second round, doing another retrieval before we get you pregnant with the results of the first round. Because of my age, because I'm 40 years of age and they really wanted me to do that now rather than a year and a half from now after I have a baby and everything. So we thought it was very sound advice. And so right. we went and did another round. And, and it was interesting because the first round while I was doing the shots, I was saying bad words while I was putting it in because it hurt. Um, <laughs> and second round, I decided to change it and say, oh, baby, oh, baby. And, and be, you know, excited about, you know, having the baby and being focused on the baby rather than the pain or anything. So it's, it's exactly what you're saying. Just when you change your thoughts and when you change what it is that the outcome that you want, it, it really can truly change the trajectory of what it is that you're looking for. Yes, because you will take action that you wouldn't have. But let's reassure everybody that you can say as many bad thoughts as you want, it won't change your fertility. You can be as stressed <laughs> yes. as you want, yes. it won't change your fertility. It's about finding the good egg, finding yes. the good sperm, and they're coming together. Right. Yes. So you can't jinx yourself and you can't stress yourself out of fertility. That's but such for, an interesting point. Infertility can certainly give you stress. Yeah, and that's such an interesting point and I appreciate you bringing that up, doctor, because I think that there's so much misconception about that for women in particular. I think women feel like they're, because, you Did know, you blame yourself? I, I definitely, I don't know if I, if I necessarily sat there and blamed myself, but you question yourself. You, you definitely question yourself. You sit there and go, was I was I relaxed enough? Did I not stress out enough? Or you know, you everybody around you saying, just go on vacation, just relax, just whatever, and you'll get pregnant immediately, and don't think about it, and don't do this. But it's like, how how can you not do that when that's the one thing that you want the most? Of course, that's going to be the thing that you're thinking about every day. But it is interesting because I think that is even with you, I think you a lot of the times is like you got to not be stressed. And then sometimes when he's saying that to me, it makes you more stressed. <laughs> it's like blaming the victim. Yeah. yeah. Getting in to injury. Yep. You're not only infertile, but now you know, yes. it's because you're stressed. Well, of right. course I'm stressed. Right. But you know what's right. interesting is, that, is I, I have a hard time with this because I feel like there is a stigma around the fact that a lot of infertility issues are women. But I think there's so many of the fertility issues are men. Absolutely. And it's not talked about. Absolutely. And so now my partner is having to go through these shots and the discomfort and the bloating and all these things because of an infertility issue that I might have. And I feel obligated to do everything I can to eliminate the stress, if at all possible. Do those little extra things around the house because she is doing this for us and for our family. So, you know, I want to put the onus back on men to be as good a partner as possible. Eliminate the challenges that your spouse has in her day-to-day -day life if she's going to go through this process for your family. Because it, it's a lot. I don't know what, how so we would be. It. I don't know how I would be if I was the one having to inject myself I two could or tell three you. times a day. Yeah, <laughs> I'd exactly. whine like a little baby. A little crazy. I yeah. Call a little crazy. Yeah. No, there's that saying, if men had to give birth, there'd be no humans on I <laughs> <laughs> That is so funny. I was Probably saying true. that the other night in bed. I was like, why does God make us go through so, like, we have to get the period, we have to go through uh, getting pregnant, we have to go through childbirth, like, mm -hmm. we have to have them suck on our <laughs> boobies and it hurts so bad. I'm like, why do we get, like, why didn't you they have why, to though? suck on something from because, you? Because, <laughs> like, why is it, it all on us? <laughs> when it comes to the culture, women are the strong ones. Good, good, good answer. answer. Good Guys answer. like to pretend that we're good strong. Good answer. We might have some physicality, but the truth is, it's about the women. <laughs> but. As Gretchen's saying, we do have to go through with it. So let's talk about what partners can do, even if they didn't have an issue themselves, even if it's just the age of the DNA in the woman and she spent years getting education and she spent years You're working right. and it took years to find the wonderful yeah. guy. Yeah. Whatever the reason is, nature thought we'd be eaten by a bear by the time we're 30. <laughs> and there we are trying to have babies and we're feeling young and looking young. Yeah. So let's talk about things that partners can do. I have a whole list that I want you to comment on. Okay. But first, I want to hear from the two of you. What do you think is the number one thing that you got from Slade that helped you as your partner get through it? Um, you know, I think honestly just 
it, this might sound really cheesy, but just being there, mm -hmm. like even when I'm just doing the shots, just having his presence there, because I actually injected him myself, but him just walking down and, and saying, okay, honey, you're doing your shot, I'm here, and you know, helping pull out the meds or going and getting the ice pack from the refrigerator, or just knowing that he was there and that I wasn't alone, that I wasn't doing it on my own. And so that, I mean, the long, there was such a long list that he was so good at and that he did for me, but that one in particular just meant a lot, that he just, he just was there. Good, so let's call that tip number one, and I happen to think that's the most important tip of all, because a lot of partners worry, what should I say, what should I do? And the answer is exactly what you said, Gretchen. You don't have to say or do anything. Right. You have to be, be there. there. Sometimes yeah. say nothing, just be there. Yeah. Let you talk, which is tip number two. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. Let her talk yeah. as much as she has to, to hear herself. Yeah. Because when you hear what you say out loud, you can correct it. You can say, I'm never going to do this again. And once you hear yourself say it, you right. might say, well, maybe one more time, or maybe right. we'll, we'll give it a chance, and maybe right. we'll look for another doctor. <laughs> so, so true. Yeah. How is that between you, the talking, the conversation? Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's what's good, actually. <laughs> I mean, I will tell you that I've learned in our relationship, and probably a big secret to our relationship, is I've learned that Gretchen needs to verbally articulate what she's thinking. And, and to your point, a lot of times when, when she does verbalize it, she actually thinks through it and kind of comes up with the answer exactly. on her own. It's not my job to solve the problem. But I will also tell you that, you know, a tip for men, I have to suggest get engaged. Be, be present, listen to what she has to say, and be engaged in what's happening because to know the needles, how to mix the meds, how to keep her from being in pain when she does the injection or to be there with the cotton ball or the alcohol swab, get engaged in what they have to go through because every partner out there will have a much better appreciation for what your partner's doing if you engage. Don't expect her to do this on her own, because it's not fair. I'll take it one step further. I really recommend that everybody out there learn the terms. Yeah. Read a book about it if you need to, so when she's talking about a particular test, or a, you know what she's talking about. She doesn't have to explain that just when she's feeling lousy. So I absolutely agree. That's a great tip. Here's one also for guys. You tell me what you think about this slate. What I've been told by patients is that in general, male partners, more than female partners, female, female, this is male, female, want to fix everything for us. So we tell them what's wrong, they tell us what we should do. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they don't want to hear about it again because they already dealt with it. Yeah. So my tip is we don't need fixing don't tell us how to fix it mm -hmm. when we say be there we mean listen to us what do you think about that no i think you're you're right but that is a a flaw in the male persona and, and what i mean by that is men feel like their ability to fix something mm -hmm. uh, replaces um, or maybe strokes their own ego about their relevance and importance in providing something back to the partner and I don't necessarily believe that I need to fix something. I'm not trying to be something other than I am because we truly are partners. And so we talk through everything together. And I think that it's also very short-sighted on a partner to respond back with their assumption of the fix and think that, okay, now I've done my part and I can walk away and let's not talk about it anymore. I mean, that's not fair to either. I have one for the female partner also, which is I think we forget that it counts if we have to ask for something. That very often we expect a loving partner to know what we need. Right. And especially when you're going through this, it right. might be hard to put your finger on what you need, but right. if you can, yeah. tell them, yeah. ask for it. Yeah. You find yourself doing that? You know what's interesting about me? I, I there, Thankfully, I'm a very, like you said, I'm a very verbal person, so I really, <laughs> I really let them know what it is that I need on, on anything in my life, but I'm, but I'm also just a very assertive person in that way. Um, however, I do agree with you that there's many times that you're going through an emotion and you just expect your partner to think, like I have many, many friends that just are like, well, he should just know, and I'm like, but no, he shouldn't just know. Like, why should he just know, you know? And I've had that conversation with my mom several times with, with my mom and dad. I'm like, no, mom, just tell him what you need. Why is that so hard? Articulate. So, yeah, so for Use me, 
For me, I think that it's it's such a simple thing to do and it's such a simple thing that can help alleviate stress between a couple. So if you know that that's going to alleviate that, why wouldn't you do that? You know what I mean? I think it helps if the partner asks, what can I do to help rather than try to read your mind? And then it really yeah. helps if you answer. Yes. This is what I need. Yes, yeah. because this that, is what I don't need. Because a lot of the times that the partner says, what do I need? Sometimes that aggravates the woman even more because they're like, well, but you, you should, should just know. know. Right. And so I think that the partners have to be a little bit forgiving of one another and know that, you know, he really might not know what you need in that moment. And so. I might not know exactly or I might not be able to articulate exactly what I need. So be loving and, and for, you know, forgiving in that moment and just say, you know, how can we figure this out? I mean, I remember when we first did the shots and I didn't know, I was so scared putting that shot in, but you and I talked about it and you're like, okay, what do you need? And I said, I don't know. And then he came up with the, with the fix of getting out a little ice pack. And it was like just the simplest thing like that and putting that on and it was like it changed the whole thing between us. And I didn't even know I needed that. You know what I mean? I didn't even know I needed the ice pack. And once I put the ice pack on and the needle didn't hurt nearly as bad going in, I was like, thank goodness that he was there. But he was listening to me saying, it's so painful when the needle goes in. I take it a step further. I say not only learn about it, I say go to appointments if you can, because when two people are there, yeah. he can help you remember what you might have been thinking about last week, but now you're at the doctor's office and you don't even remember. Two people are listening. Afterwards, yeah. you might only remember half. There might be history that he could fill in. Did you go to appointments together? Yeah, he came we to every appointment. We don't miss an appointment. That's yeah. great. He came to every single That's appointment. That's great. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's true because when you're going through the IVF, you don't even realize that you, you have kind of like this crazy brain. Like I call it crazy brain during the time. Like you can't even remember things. It's, it's the a weirdest lot of thing. information. For but, any one person to have to remember. But I'm saying it's meds and, and hormones. Right. But what that's, that's, I think, what threw me off is I actually think my hormones were truly out of whack because I consider myself somebody that can remember things and I'm pretty mm -hmm. good and I have lists and I have this. And I literally was like, I, what did she say? Do I take this in the morning? Do I take this at night? And I found myself just kind of whacked some of the time. So I was so grateful he was there because he's like, no, honey, they said to take this at this time or whatever. So I think that was, uh, first of well, all, it showed that he cared and yes. he was engaged and that... Um, and, and we call him Dr. Smiley anyway, so half the time he's in there, he's like answering what the doc, before the doctor gives the answer, he's given the answer, and the doctor's always making fun, going, thank you, Dr. Smiley. <laughs> <laughs> Just so everyone knows, Dr. Siri called me his associate today. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> Here are my don'ts. Are you ready for the don'ts? Tell okay. me if you agree. I have members who write, tell people not to use cliches. Even if they mean it, it doesn't sound good and you don't believe it. <laughs> like, That's funny. Gee, honey, I'm sorry. Cliche. Or, Cliche. I wish I could go through it for you. <laughs> Cliche. You did say that a couple times. You did well, say that. Well, it worked in the moment. Yeah. No, uh -huh. no, it was funny. That's funny. I, it's interesting because I don't know if that bothered me that much. I, I think that when he said to me, gosh, I wish I could do this for you, I, I Maybe because we have such a different, you know, connection between him and me. Um, well, meaning just the because difference is though, as I, I tried to go do something, so you didn't have to go through it. Maybe that's true. Yeah. So and you actually did. I actually did. I actually did. Yeah. So that's why. I mean, obviously, if I said something like that, I'm being sincere yeah. because yeah. I'm willing to do what I have to do to make so it happen. So maybe that's why. But maybe in that's general, why. yes. Yeah. In general. But in general, if you're yes. not going through a reverse vasectomy, it might not be a good idea to say, gee, I wish I could be throwing up for you. <laughs> yeah. She's not going to believe it, right? She's right. not going to take the bait on that. Here's another note from a, uh, from a member. I get a lot of philosophy like it could be worse. Thank God it's not cancer. Oh, geez. Yeah, no. Does that mean anything to Absolutely somebody going no. through this? Absolutely no. not. Not even, no. That's even if their bad. heart's in the right place. Yeah. yeah, no, that's bad. And here's the final note. This is from a listener. Don't forget what she's going through. Don't drink in front of her. Don't smoke. Don't do all the things she's not allowed to do. I hadn't even thought about that until I read the note. Yeah. That's true. That's interesting. Yeah, it really just kind of rub it in your face. That is interesting. If you're out drinking and just kind of living the life and you have to like yeah. be very conscious of what you're eating and what you're drinking and I'm just 
Yeah, that's, a, that's an that's easy way a partner can be of help that they might not have even 100%. thought of. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's a great, that's a great thing, that's yeah. That's a good suggestion. The research is finding that when you have a supportive partner going through an infertility journey, you not only have fewer psychological symptoms, but you have fewer physical symptoms with a supportive partner. Interesting. I would, I would believe that. Yeah, I would believe and that, And us too. especially because yeah. Gretchen's... Um, Stress or psychological challenges manifest themselves physically. Mm -hmm. I so see. She, so you're like, taking that The back away. can mm -hmm. hurt. The leg can hurt. Like, yeah. like there's a lot of my hair has fallen out before when I was like really stressed or mm -hmm. upset about things. Yeah, so. her body really physically yeah. shows the amount of stress or anxiety that she's under at any given time. I suspect that you're right, but in addition, we're built for daily life. The research I do on stress and all the books I've written are about that. And if you have a partner that keeps you involved in daily life, you're not thinking as much about mm -hmm. all the physical symptoms as well as the psychological. Right. And you're remembering you're a value to somebody. And you're remembering that there's a moment where you can reemerge into laughter or see right. a movie. Right, right. So maybe That's part of true. that also helps the physical symptoms. That's very true, because even just now, I, I was, I felt like I had swollen up like a balloon yesterday and I was struggling today still even coming here and I'm like, oh, not feeling great. And we were in the uh, ultrasound and he was just making me giggle and laugh and it's like I forgot that I even felt crummy, you know what I mean? It's like it kind of makes it just go away. So, I mean, we do, we just <laughs> laugh all day long. So that's such a good point. I think it's really important that that partner is, is that, uh, that reflection for you, that mm. sometimes you, you aren't able to find yourself during those times. Let's hope that you have great, great success. There is always a way if you want a family, so I hope you look forward to you. a family. Thank you, we do. So we look forward to your, it so much. Speak to the members. What would be you your know, final tips? I would say, um, gosh, there's so many things. <laughs> I mean, it's just like there's so many things. But honestly, for us, I just think that the togetherness and helping each other and I mean like the simplest of things like this morning I woke up and he just knows how much I love waffles and I come downstairs and he had waffles made for me I mean it's just the simplest of things that your partner can do to show that they love you and care for you and and are there for you during during this period I think I think we touched on so many of them already yeah. about the being present at the appointments and and really being involved and caring about what you're going through. I got to tell you, this man is like a saint because I, there are so many times that you just lose it for no reason. Like you just go to crazy town and you're just angry and yelling at something and it's like n nowhere close to his fault that the milk just spelt or something crazy like that. But I'm yelling at him, acting like it's his fault. And he does, he just laughs it off and he's like, okay, honey, and he just comes and gets a towel and he's never um, angry back at me or aggressive towards me or, or you know, um, has a bad mouth towards me or anything like that. He just allows me to be, have my moment. And I think that's a really important thing because I think that maybe we are looking. Don't take it personally, you're saying. Yes, don't take it personally. Be there. Yeah. Don't take it personally. Yes. And so I, he just was so good about that. I mean, he just never got upset, even though I deserved it sometimes because I was so mad at him for no reason of his, <laughs> you know, but, but he, he had just, the big picture. Yes, he did. Well, I think I understand in the moment that if she's feeling a certain way, it's mm -hmm. because of what she's going through. It's not truly how she feels. And there, there's a big difference there. And I have to give Gretchen a lot of credit because early on in our relationship, when we first started dating, if there was ever any conflict, she made me talk about it right in that moment. And as a man, we like to marinate. I want to think about it. I don't want to have a conversation. And she forced me to discuss it. And that has been the foundation of our relationship for everything. Because we, <laughs> right? right? We, and we talk about Good psychology. everything. Yeah, right. But we do. We talk about everything. And so things aren't allowed to fester. Things aren't allowed to get bad. You know, you pull that splinter out right away before it becomes mm -hmm. an infection. And, mm -hmm. and truly, I think that, you know, that has helped us so much just in everyday life. So when it comes to challenges like this, we are in it together. We're, we're engaged, we're learning it, we're, we're going through this process. I want, you know, I don't want my partner to have to do more than I'm willing to do. So it's really been the difference, I think, in our relationship. You are in it together and everything you're going through, yeah. she's going through yeah. 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 for you. Yeah. She's throwing up for you. She's she voting is. for you. <laughs> she is. And, and you're there with her, which is great. And we're there for you.
And if you want more information, go to progeny.com slash education. And I want to thank Gretchen Christine Rossi for being here and her fiance, Slade Smiley, who seem to be going on a journey very much together. 